Hi everyone. I think everyone's coming through from the lobby now, so I think we'll get started. Big warm welcome to you today. My name is Laura Hill. I head up Cloud Essentials in our UK region. It's uh, my pleasure to host the session today and I'm joined by Navasha, my colleague who is your main presenter, who's a tech savvy compliance specialist. Um, Navasha, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. My name is Navasha. Um, as Laura said, I'm a compliance lead at Cloud Essentials. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm an internationally certified compliance practitioner via the International Federation of Compliance Institute, uh, sorry, associations, as well as a designated compliance practitioner via the Compliance Institute of Southern Africa, or KISA, if you're, if you're familiar with it. I have experience within the financial services industry as a knowledge management consultant. I've worked as a commercial legal advisor, as well as a regulatory compliance specialist managing compliance across multiple jurisdictions and under the purview, no pun intended, of local and international regulators. Back Thank to you, Rasha. Thank you. So the aim of the session or time today is that you will have gained some from our experience uh, from a, a risk a data protection perspective some uh, some points to kind of throw into your mixing pot I suppose of of your thinking around Microsoft 365 Copilot so we're going to share with you uh, top concerns that we're hearing from conversations within um, C-suite and at board level data security initiatives that we really think are worth prioritizing the business case and building that business case around risk mitigation towards um, your co-pilot journey and some very practical quick wins around protecting data. So the format we're going to follow is Microsoft. We're going to work through um, the presentation content during which we would love to capture some input. So please keep an eye on the chat panel for some participation via Slido. Um, our colleagues Chris and Sally are also going to be quite active in that chat, um, which can get quite a lively place as well to so keep an eye on that and feel free to type questions as we go. We will certainly tackle them at the end and very happy to, to stop the recording at that point and lift off mics as well um, to have more of a, a Q&A session. So just quickly by way of introduction to Cloud Essentials, we are a very long-standing Microsoft partner around the area of content management and it's why we're very excited about Microsoft 365 Copilot because it really just builds on the work that we do every day with our clients to help them manage their content. So we deliver professional services to migrate data into the Microsoft Cloud ecosystem often from legacy on-premises, third-party platforms, think document management systems, think email archives, file shares, et cetera, into Microsoft 365. But then also delivering services to really create the conditions for that data to be managed in a very compliant, secure, well-governed way. We have a very unique offering around the adoption of Microsoft Purview, which is Microsoft's native solutions for data security and compliance compliance through to e-discovery, um, where we deliver compliance advisory from Navasha and her team combined with very technical services to really get adoption accelerated. So for our clients, we're really sort of ensuring that all of that data growing and being collaborated on within Microsoft 365 can ultimately be used as a business asset, um, which of course is the entire vision behind Microsoft 365 Copilot. So last year, Microsoft launched the co-pilots um, and continually evolving multiple co-pilot solutions, different use cases, different outcomes, uh, but all with the same sort of intention of AI being embedded into your world uh, for productivity gains. So deeply integrated into applications and day-to-day -day, um, workflow, really sort of acting as an extension 
um, of your capability and assistant to you. So there's security co-pilot for improving identification of security issues, reporting, remediation. There's GitHub co-pilot for developers to help them write better code a lot faster. Um, and then one of the co-pilots is Microsoft 365 co-pilot, which is where we're focusing today for content generation and um, sort of insights within Office 365 applications. So I'm just going to dip quickly into a bit of Microsoft content here just to give you uh, very quickly Copilot, Microsoft 365 Copilot sort of in a nutshell. So if you sign up to get licenses for Microsoft 365 Copilot, it will live within your everyday Office 365 apps, your Excel, your Teams, your PowerPoint. And it is fundamentally, as I say, that productivity tool to achieve content generation, um, perhaps sort of analytical outcomes quicker. And, you know, that's that's the win. So some very simple examples here are perhaps giving Copilot a prompt to generate a summary of a long technical document, uh, perhaps with Microsoft Word. To summarize trends from within data, um, perhaps from uh, Excel spreadsheets. And then suggestions on maybe what to say in an email within a, a specific tone of voice. And these are very basic illustrations. Uh, certainly an observation from us would be that in certain industries, organizations are really starting to look quite uh, sort of towards quite transformational use cases, you know, especially where they're really compelled by productivity, they're compelled by, um, you know, time is money, because Copilot is about those productivity outcomes. So for example, we're seeing legal firms thinking towards Copilot and ways that they can really get a competitive advantage from essentially doing more in less time. Uh, and it, it kind of makes sense for legal firms. Um, they own and work with and generate a lot of content. So for a legal firm, potentially quite administrative tasks can become more efficient um, and maybe at the more sort of specialised fee earning end of the spectrum, there's potential scope there for AI um, assistance in document reviews, standardising documents, um, client communications, etc. So I think the use cases are just they're starting to surface um, with a bit more sophistication from Microsoft and as organizations kind of explore, explore how they can be used. I'm not going to attempt a presentation about the wizardry of how Microsoft 365 Copilot works, uh, but I think it is important to just level up and, and understand a couple of very basic principles just to set the scene for the rest of the webinar and what uh, Nivash is going to talk us through today. And that is that in using Microsoft 365 Copilot, you're using these natural language prompts within these apps to make those requests to Copilot. And then the process behind the scenes will improve that prompt. It will make a call to the Microsoft Graph to retrieve your business content and context. And you can sort of think of Microsoft Graph as this, this gateway to drawing intelligence out of your business content. So this then modified prompt will go to the large language models, which returns back your result to Microsoft Graph for things like aligning with your security controls, your access controls, because the process will only return to you as a user responses that you've currently um, got, got access to. So yeah, that response then goes back to use the user um, and or sort of commands to the apps to, to execute on whatever the task was that you'd asked it uh, to do. So yeah, it's just important to note that the process is you taking from not giving into the large language model, so your data isn't feeding it. And secondly, that this process will respect your data security controls. You just have to have them. Um, so just hold on to those principles. Navash is going to expand um, both in, in just a moment. But just before she does so, I do just want to throw um, a question out to, um, to participants today, just to gauge some context for you, from you, sorry, on where you are at on your journey towards making that investment into Microsoft 365 Copilot. So I'm just going to launch a um, question into the chat, asking exactly that. Um, yeah, where are you? 
on your journey towards investing in Microsoft 365 Copilot. So this is um, 365 Copilot, those chargeable licenses, as opposed to using Copilot within uh, within Edge. So uh, yeah, are you are you live with Copilot? Maybe you were part of early adopter uh, programs. Is there an initial pilot scheme in progress? Have you already got licenses and you're sort of having a play? Maybe you're preparing to get licenses or exploring just the possibility of it um, or actually no current plans at all uh, to, to look at it. So I'll just let the votes come in. You should see that in your in the right hand side panel. Oh, I can see a few responses now, including exploring possibilities on paper, aware of it. Um, some have got licenses having to play, some are in pilot scheme. Interesting. Yeah, very different actually to when we asked a similar question on our first uh, webinar we did around Copilot six months ago, which feels like a lifetime ago. Um, and yeah, I suppose it speaks to the fact that organisations are mobilising around it. You know, things really have shifted in the last six months. Um, it is fast moving technology, fast moving marketing and positioning from Microsoft. Um, and actually within an already fast moving and fast changing landscape of, of other factors as well, like, for example, regulatory change. So, yeah, just I suppose to set the tone here and acknowledge that we are all on this learning curve um, and we're bringing some food for thought on on risk today. It's not an exhaustive list, um, but our our commitment to our clients remains unchanged really since since before we started talking about Comb Pilot, and that is to to really create these conditions of minimal risk within Microsoft 365. Um, because our aim is that you can operate in this this top left quadrant here, this this low risk, high reward zone as you go through these incremental stages of, of co-pilot adoption and, and exploring uh, co-pilot for your organization, you know, so that you can really make the right call at the right time on progression um, with your journey within an, uh, sort of acceptable risk tolerances for your organization. And that uh, kind of leads us into, um, I suppose, how we, how we see those early stages of that journey um, of working with Microsoft 365 Copilot through the lens of our uh, maturity framework. So we believe that there are five journeys that kind of need to come together as you start, uh, I suppose, writing your Copilot story, and you will already be somewhere on these journeys. And the more progress you've already made, or I suppose the more you're prepared to invest in these areas, the the higher the probability we think of seeing faster, bigger return on investment from generative AI and doing so at a lower risk. So I just want to unpack what we mean, um, starting at this this center point of you know, using generative AI to achieve a business outcome. So, you know, really starting with a bit of a strategic vision for, for wanting to embrace Microsoft 365 Copilot. And then actually more grassroots sort of identification of potential business processes that might gain from it, you know, so that you can go on that learning curve uh, a lot more um, effectively and with intention. And then just moving around uh, anti-clockwise, you know, it's it's likely that your data security journey might need some reflection as you look towards uh, making some moves with Microsoft 365 Copilot. You know, because Copilot plays into your security, your compliance, your privacy controls, and you'll already be actively working in this space. Um, you might just need some fresh benchmarking and prioritization of of actions to take. You know, maybe based on your um, Copilot guinea pig groups uh, for want of a better word 
And the same for data governance maturity. And there's a there's a sort of double whammy here um, in that the better your governance. So, for example, if you are really actively implementing retention management, the lower your risk, but also the better quality output from Copilot when data is is accurate, it is complete, it is relevant, it is reliable. And then moving around, there may be some ongoing effort around content optimization. So improving the quality of the output. You know, no one's going to restructure their entire data estate to aid AI. And in fact, that would kind of defeat the point of AI doing all that legwork for you. Um, but a, a sort of growing consciousness of, of the structure around your data, the boundaries, a degree of curation and, and monitoring for the quality and the accuracy um, of, of your inputs and outputs around Copilot. And then coming full circle to a, a very full sort of powerful lever that you will want to pull, uh, which is managing change and this sort of mind shift to working and being in conversation with a with an AI sidekick beside you and really sort of overseeing user adoption to get maximum reward. So our approach is to use this sort of maturity assessment to help you benchmark in these areas so that you can formulate what a a, what a pragmatic, what a sensible co-pilot adoption roadmap might look like. And yeah, if you if you perceive that you're falling short of where you want to be on that risk continuum, you know, that's where we as a, as a partner can continue to help you um, on your journey, because that is that is your risk to carry in alignment with the Microsoft shared responsibility model. And, and Microsoft have revised this recently to, to bring clarity to AI. Um, but in using Microsoft Cloud Services, you're signed up to this. Uh, and the fundamental division is unchanged, it, that you take on the risk inherent in your data, your IP, the sensitive data you carry, the regulatory obligations that you are under, you know, your housekeeping duties. Um, and the rest of the session will will really look at your tactical moves around that. Um, but then Rasha, maybe from a you know from more of a compliance perspective, can you can you just clarify the the Microsoft side of the bargain here, um, and also how far AI regulation goes um, before you then kind of face us inward um, towards tackling the the risk on our side of the bargain? Yeah, sure. Thanks for that positioning, Laura. I think it's important to understand because what I might share might be a bit of a mouthful around Microsoft's you know, various commitments, but it's important to understand that they began this journey or rather this responsible AI journey back in 2017. So for now, I'm just gonna be unpacking an overview of some of these commitments, but um, if you want more information, we can obviously drop that on the chat as we go along. So let's start with the fact that the Microsoft Cloud runs on trust. So you might have seen this before, you might have thought, okay, that's clever marketing, but what does that mean actually? So that means that your data is your data. So Laura mentioned this earlier as well. It doesn't become part of Microsoft's data. It remains yours. That means it's yours to own, to control, and it's, it's for you to choose how you want to leverage it and if you want to monetize it. Secondly, your data is not used to train or enrich Microsoft AI models. So it's really important that you understand only your organization benefits from your data and only your organization benefits from enhanced business processes. And thirdly, your data is you your data used within AI models rather is protected at every step of the way. So again, we've alluded to this earlier, just that importance of having uh, compliance and security controls. But what Microsoft um, commits to is that the, the fact that um, your data will be protected by the most comprehensive enterprise security and compliance controls in the industry. We'll unpack some of this later as part of our readiness model as well. But as it stands right now, this can be deemed as Microsoft's trust boundary within cloud. However, they've also made a few other AI specific commitments. So one such commitment is in the form of their responsible AI standard. This standard is quite comprehensive, so it's made up of six key principles and each of these principles have sub goals. Um, these principles covers areas such as fairness, transparency, accountability, um, and various other key best practices. 
However, uh, what I think is interesting, and I think a lot of people might have heard of this due to the headlines recently, is uh, their most recent commitment is more around um, their copyright commitment. So what does this mean? So the Microsoft Copilot copyright commitment is a new benefit and it extends to it extends rather to intellectual property indemnity support to certain paid copilot services. So this came into effect uh, around well on 1 October 2023 and how this works is if a third party sues a commercial customer for copyright infringement related to their use of Microsoft Copilot services or the output generated by Copilot, Microsoft will then stand in and defend that customer. So the, the commitment itself, it covers copyright, patent, trademarks, uh, trade secrets, or the right of publicity claims. So as with anything, terms and conditions do apply. So it's important to note that customers must use the built-in guardrails and content filters and avoid as far as possible um, generating infringing materials. So as a basis, these are Microsoft's commitments to you to help build customer confidence to leverage the power of AI technology. However, as again, as we alluded to earlier, other than technology, it's important to understand your obligations from a regulatory um, and legal perspective right now. So much like with the introduction of privacy regulations, the AI governance and regulatory landscape is evolving rapidly. Uh, so I'm not attempting here to summarize the countless pieces of draft legislation, strategic plans, or even the comprehensive EU AI Act that was recently enacted. We also saw the International Organizations for Standardization, or ISO, introduced the ISO 42001. So this is an artificial intelligence management standard, and this is really their aim at trying to standardize, no pun intended, the implementation of AI and some of the key um, management system controls that are needed. However, across the board, either um, in these governance documents, what we're seeing is key themes. So those themes are transparency, governance, data privacy and security, as well as, it uh, depends how you see it, the promotion of fairness, but also the elimination of bias. And lastly, and what we saw most notably um, in the EU AI Act is the adoption of this risk-based approach. So we will cover some of the best practices we found as part of our readiness assessment um, to help manage these requirements and how it can be built into a compliance strategy if you don't have these already. Because as, as we said, a lot of this is already provided for probably in your uh, compliance strategy, and now we're just going to help you identify some of them as we go along. So. I think now that Laura has shown us, you know, all the amazing benefits. So generative AI promises to boost productivity and enhance work processes, but there's many concerns. There's many, many valid concerns. I think as much as I've read content on the positivity and, you know, the benefits of, of using generative AI, we've probably seen the same amount of content around the concerns around uh, AI, and these are normally being raised at the top by our executives. So we'd love to hear from you. So you'll see on the chat, there's another slide. Oh, what are you concerned about? Um, and while, you, while you're busy getting to that, what we've seen is uh, some of our clients who really range across various industries, because AI, like privacy regulations, you know, filter across industries and carry very similar risk, regardless of the type of industry you're in. However, what we've seen is concerns raised around, again, data privacy, data loss, abuse, or rather misuse, uh, amongst various other things. So we'd love to hear from you. What are some of the concerns that you've heard, either from your C-suite or even from yourself? What are you worried about? Yeah. Laura, are we getting some responses there? Just looking at them. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I see AI governance coming through. I'm hoping some of the content <laughs> we're about to unpack will help with that. Um, yeah, I've not got uh, responses there. There is a, a question which maybe speaks to um, a concern about balancing the balancing act, um, balancing the benefits of co-pilot AI 
capabilities for productivity and innovation, balancing it with the stringent compliance and security requirements um, that are mandated, uh, particularly in highly regulated sectors, sectors such as um, healthcare or finance. So yeah, so maybe a uh, a worry there about treading this uh, treading this line and, and the balancing act that that, that causes. Yeah, we've seen that's actually quite a common one because it's 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 constantly a balance, right? It's, do we avoid AI? Do we, you know, tread very carefully? But then, does where does that leave us in in you know in 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 the landscape of our competitors? How are we staying competitive? How are we innovating without AI? So, but again, how do we do this in a manner that's compliant without attracting huge fines from a data privacy perspective, or you know? Uh, losing intellectual property. How do we balance that? So I'm hoping um, in the slides that we, that follow, we'll we'll unpack uh, again the Cloud Essentials Agile approach to co-pilot maturity that Laura introduced earlier, but also some really practical tips um, on on how to navigate this journey a little bit. So yeah, I will just mention the slide it has updated, so we'll just call it a few okay. now, um, which is so concerns over over retention, the impact of that, incorrect information. No. just given to service users and the liability of that um responsible ai use insider risk data privacy um accuracy managers using copilot to monitor employees uh, um using copilot for performance reviews um return on investment misuse data loss um yeah quite a mixing yeah. pot Thank you for sharing. I'm hoping that we cover a lot of these concerns as we we proceed. Uh, but yeah, also, if you have any more specific questions, please feel free to drop it in the chat and we'll either address it as we go along or at the end. So thank you for sharing. So Laura introduced our journey earlier, um, just the five areas we recommend that you use to assess your maturity. So what this could mean after this assessment, it either is going to show that you're quite immature and in a reactive mode, or that you've actually already embedded people, process and technology controls, which means you're optimizing. So at this level, it means you're able to predict and prevent nearly all potential issues, leading to maximum operational efficiency and minimal downtime. I mean, that's an ideal state to be in, especially when deploying new, technolo new technology like AI. However, your journey is your journey. So depending on where you want to be, um, the following might be tactical moves you can make to improve your stance around data security and data governance. So what we've suggested is categorizing this into three broad categories because we, we are aware of how overwhelming it can seem. So if we say manage your data security, manage your data governance, what does that actually look like? Uh, so for the purposes of this webinar and in terms of our uh, methodology, we've categorized into three broad categories. So promoting user accountability when using Copilot, management of access to AI apps, and protecting, as well as protecting the data entered and created by Microsoft 365 Copilot. So in the slides that follow, I'll unpack what that means for, for, for you. So if we start right at the top, promoting user accountability, here we're really looking at governance considerations. So the governance considerations for AI are similar to most of your existing risk and compliance obligations. So I think it's very important to guard against, you know, reinventing something or, or or creating standalone processes where it might already exist within your organization. So it's crucial for organizations to ensure that their people, process and technology controls effectively address the risks associated or posed by the use of AI. And this will help instill confidence among stakeholders and safeguard the organization's success. So before implementing AI, organizations should consider their decision making around governance, data security and cultural values to account for potential impacts. Um, so you'll see again as we unpack, I'm going to cover a little bit more detail around things like your AI policy. But although the governance journey again can seem like a mountain, your organization can start by taking some of the following steps. 
So identifying your regulatory obligations. This probably already exists in the form of your regulatory universe. So it could look like updating um, your regulatory universe to add AI regulatory or AI related regulatory obligations. But it's very important to note that some of these obligations already exists. It just might not say th this is specifically relating to artificial intelligence. It's rather around protecting your data, securing your data. And as we know, this is already in existence in our data privacy obligation. So some of these controls already exist. They might just need to be enhanced to cater for your use of AI. So it's also important with the introduction of just like introducing any new risk into your environment, increasing your compliance oversight here. So this means establishing robust policies uh, to ensure that AI is utilized in a responsible and ethical manner. This could either be done by using your existing policy. So if you already have an acceptable use policy or the creation of um, an AI policy. So I will unpack some of the steps to creating an AI policy in the slides that follow. So it's it's really crucial to address the scope of AI and put measures in place to ensure responsible and ethical use. I think those are the key words here. Governance, ensuring responsibility and ethical use as well as accountability. But I highlight and address some of these key foundational best practices um, in our next slide. So first and foremost, we recommend forming a task team. So if you're familiar with Cloud Essentials and our Compliance Accelerator program, where we introduce or we, we, we assist you push um, your purview deployment goals, we recommend establishing a compliance panel. In this instance, it would be a co-pilot panel. Or if you're already in an accelerator program with us, this would be a subset of that panel. So the purpose of this panel is really to um, create a decision making body. It consists of stakeholders across the business, but this is at executive level. So it's really helping to it's twofold. So one, it helps you make decisions, but it also helps you establish accountability. I think with the deployment of any new technology, um, the question from IT or from compliance is OK, so who needs to own this? Um, therefore, um, but by creating this panel, no business unit really gets left behind. And an AI policy is a good place to start. It really helps bring people together. So secondly, as part of this AI policy creation, but also as part of your AI strategy, it would be to educate your stakeholders. So everyone who has a say in your policy creation needs to be educated on AI's risk and rewards. I think too, too often people might take for granted, especially if you're in a technology role, or if, then you might assume people understand the technology. If you're in a risk role, you might think that a lot of these risks are self-explanatory. However, organizing an AI workshop for your board members or members within this panel is a great way to introduce or reinforce essential AI concepts and ensure everyone is operating from an informed starting position. So the next point is really setting your policy objectives. So what is your organization or your organization's goal for using AI? Then we recommend formalizing your ethical standards and your intention to use AI responsibly. So this, you might already have policies that, that speak to this in, in different ways so that it could be in your ethics a policy or you might have a code of conduct. So make sure you include references to these kind of documents. Then you'll need to understand um, how, require, how regulatory requirements um, impact or might overlap with your existing regulatory universe and your compliance risk management plan to increase your oversight. So make sure your risk coverage plan, for example, is um, or is in uh, is enhanced rather to create or to make provision for now AI monitoring. So it does that. So will that fit within your existing monitoring scope? Most likely because a lot of these controls overlap with your privacy controls. So I think that's why it's it's really important um, for you to understand where there's this overlap. We also recommend you explore and understand and define your AI use cases and understand your associated risks. So 
this this might mean understanding what your associated risks are is invaluable for identifying specific vulnerabilities you'll need to control for. So this is very similar to your existing compliance and risk, um, you know, assess process. So so this normally forms part of your compliance risk management process where you're assessing your risk. Now we're saying take that same process and ensure that you're including AI in that. Um, lastly, you need to document your AI policy. I think there's too many. Um, there's so much literature currently on AI, so I made this joke earlier to my team that the only thing that's evolving faster than AI is the amount of content available on governing AI. And um, it's really important that within your organization, you try and be as practical as possible. So I think even in this webinar, that's what we're trying to do, so provide some practical tips to implementation. So when you create this policy, the documentation should be shared across your organization and preferably as part of a wider AI training program that educates your stakeholders um, and users on AI related risks rules and responsibilities. And also it's very important because of the changing landscape to always monitor and review this policy periodically. So we can, sorry, thanks Laura, we can move on to the next slide. So the next um, category we wanted to focus on is managing access to generative AI. So as we know, uh, first and foremost, there are various AI applications or tool sets in the market right now. Again, it, it, it's, it's impossible for me to list all of them, um, but you need to define and like really take control of the process and say, define what's allowed within your organization. And this again is usually based on your risk appetite, your as well as security and productivity considerations, which you should have worked out as part of your AI policy and strategy. So in addition, you should also be able to put measures in place to ensure that only employees who have the necessary training and awareness can access the relevant apps. So this is especially relevant where an organization is embarking on a staggered risk based deployment, which we believe is best practice. So when establishing a timeline for who should be given access to Copilot um, and the type of access, it's important to understand that the level of training required will depend on the user itself or the user themselves rather. So you need to understand the user's current exposure and experience to understand the legal and compliance or reputational impact their usage might have. And also look at the business units at which you, you know, where you are deploying this technology to make sure that you're actually getting maximum productivity. So it's important to realize that sometimes implementing or, or, or switching on technology could be simpler uh, once it's done in a manner that involves people and process. So actually putting your policy together, actually defining who the relevant people are and making sure you have processes to support them. So the next category we really want to look at is protecting the data entered into entered and created by AI apps. So how do you do that practically? The introduction of Copilot uh, to your current security landscape can be seen as opening an additional pathway to risks that you might already have. So for example, the implementation of user authentication and access controls should already be in existence in a good you know data management and data governance strategy to comply with privacy legislation and as well as minimize your risk of data loss or data breaches however uh, we have experienced or we have had engagements with organizations who seek controls like role-based access control or multi-factor authentication as a hindrance uh, to con conducting business efficiently so it should be noted that by introducing Copilot, organizations now need to reconsider that decision because of the significant risk associated with the usage of generative AI. It might so where a risk where a risk might have been at an acceptable level. Um, I think the absence of of such controls now with the introduction of AI really uh, forces an organization to reconsider that decision. So. As we all know, co-pilot implementation significantly uh, in increases your inherent risks, therefore forcing stricter control implementation to lower that residual risk to an acceptable tolerance, tolerance level. So the next category um, we want to speak to is really 
data, sorry, um, sensitivity labeling. So for some of you, you might be wondering how does things like uh, classification and sensitivity labels, how does that even impact my deployment of generative AI? However, let's consider the last few years where we have seen significant increases in volumes of data and due to the COVID pandemic, a drive for greater uh, connectivity and mobility in the way we work. So let's take a step back. Data classification can be seen as a building block for data loss prevention and um, information protection through sensitivity labeling. In its most basic form, data classification is a means of protecting your data from unauthorized disclosure, alteration, or destruction based on how sensitive or impactful it is. So as we all know, data now has become a currency on its own. But it's also true that data is that all not all data is equal in terms of sensitivity and risk. Therefore, it's even more crucial for organizations to take a risk based approach in order to appropriately classify and label their data to ensure adequate and consistent protection. So this is another example of where data privacy obligations or data privacy privacy controls assist with your co pilot deployment. Because right now, companies that correctly classify data can more easily comply with legislation like the GDPR. Because in the event of an audit, they can prove compliance by logging, tracking, and reporting sensitive data usage. Um, a well-crafted data uh, classification policy allows for the tactical deployment of sensitivity labels, which facilitates content classification based on its sensitivity and risk. So what is a sensitivity label? So sensitivity labels is a key technical solution and it addresses data risks and compliance requirements. And it ensures that your data or that your business sensitive and confidential information is secured and prote protected regardless of where it finds itself through the data lifecycle. Um, so whether it's at content creation or whether it's right through to your disposition and deletion policies. So practically, let's take this and, and, and you know apply it to a practical example. Practically, once deployed, Microsoft 365, when generating content, would look at leveraging information contained within a document, regardless of where the content or the document might live. So the protection of the document and its content also needs to live everywhere. So for example, if your organization has access to sensitive health information and it isn't labeled, Copilot could use the information within that document to generate new content. Sensitivity labels help to ensure or helps to establish what the content is saying itself and if what it contains is sensitive, make a decision about what protection that piece of information requires. But then it also follows um, that information where it goes. So if a new piece of information uh, or a new piece of content was generated using that information, by having a sensitivity label in place, it help, it's smart enough to keep that protection in place and keep that information safe. So we can move on. So I know that might seem and, and, and just the idea of sensitive, sens uh, sensitivity labels, and if you're hearing about it the first time and how it fits into your strategy, it could seem extremely daunting uh, and overwhelming. And we understand that deploying that across an organization again might seem, you know, extremely um, overwhelming. However, what we have seen is deploying a perimeter protection solution like DLP or data loss prevention is an important quick win in this situation because DLP helps to set up a boundary. So it might not do the same thing as sensitivity label in that it doesn't protect data everywhere. However, it monitors the boundary. So it monitors um, as data is being created, sent and received in and out of your organization. So again, we always recommend you focus on your most high risk data as identified in your classification policy and then segment the deployment of Copilot to specific user groups. So traditionally we've seen value in or where a good place to start would be your, your HR department or your finance department because this coinc coincidentally also coincides usually with the people who might get the most value out of using Copilot. Um, and working with smaller groups really enables you to create a deployment blueprint for your organization. 
So how this might work practically is um, having DLP in place, it would be able to pick up keywords within a document and prevent that document from being shared. So it might not be able to prevent Microsoft 365 Copilot from creating content on it, but it might be able to prevent the sharing of that document or stopping it at the perimeter. So with that, I think let's move on to a little bit more um, on your collaboration hygiene. So again, with the pandemic, we saw people rushing um, to deploy collaboration tools because now there was a requirement. So the utility of remote collaboration was recognized. And uh, we like to see it as uh, the productivity tabs being switched on. And through this amazing ability to, uh, to collaborate remotely, uh, we wouldn't want that to be hindered because of oversharing or lack of permission hygiene. So nowadays, it's even, it isn't even as common to attach documents anymore. We share links, um, and this allows for greater remote collaboration, but it also reduces rework, the need for manually tracking documents uh, or documents version, and also eliminated dis eliminating disjointed or outdated content. So modern features that usually impact collaboration hygiene are things like anonymous links. And if you're sitting there and wondering what's an anonymous link, uh, an, anom an anonymous link is uh, links that can be shared or accessed by anyone. So this means that documents could be changed and shared internally or externally. Abandoned teams are also another risk here uh, and need to be looked at when cleaning up your hygiene, especially if they contain or it might contain information that in terms of your retention and disposition policies should have been deleted. So it's also it, it's very important to make sure that your access controls and user permissions are set up properly so you can regulate Copilot's access to data and keep everything secure. And by understanding how information is shared within your company, you can identify any potential oversharing and refine sharing practices to make sure data privacy is maintained. So then we're going to look at your data governance. So I know earlier we spoke about your data management and your overall data governance strategy. Here we focus a little bit more on your technology and how technology supports, um, you know, your, your data governance journey. So to get the most out of Microsoft 365 Copilot, it's important to have the strategy in place. And this means ensuring that your data does not contain rot. So what does that mean? It means it doesn't contain redundant, outdated, or trivial information. And by doing so, you can reduce your data governance risk and optimize the results from Copilot. So one key area we always recommend you focus on is your retention policies, which may or which should have been addressed as part of your privacy compliance journey. And here we see another overlap between your AI journey and your privacy journey. So we often see organizations with either very aggressive retention policies. So here um, they see this as retaining too much data might result in, you know, a bigger data risk versus those who have a keep forever mentality. So the risk that keeping outdated data carries is that um, it, it's not always left dormant. So when you introduce something to co like Microsoft 365 Copilot that's actually generating content, it's quite possible that, that this dormant data becomes quite active again. So it might form the basis of new content being generated. So for example, uh, if your existing content is outdated, inaccurate or biased, you may end up drafting something like an employment contract and it might be based on an outdated set of terms. Or you may create a, ma a marketing solution and that solution might be based on inaccurate or an outdated specification document. So it's important that your data strategy helps your organization to identify your stale data. Um, your, your strategy must also provide for archiving or deletion of your data, and it should also provide for retention and disposition processes. And again, this is both to ensure um, compliance with regulatory requirements, but also to ensure that you get the true value of the co-pilot experience. And that depends largely on the data source index by Microsoft 365. So if your tenant has abundant data across Microsoft 365, you will get the best results from Copilot. So with access to your to comprehensive organizational data, Copilot can suggest more relevant and personalized content based on the user's context and preferences. Thanks for that. Uh, we can move on.
Thanks, Narasa. Yeah, I suppose just as we start to kind of bring the session um, into land now, we're often working with professionals who are championing projects internally within their organisations to mature compliance, security governance, um, to play out some of these tactical moves that Navasha has talked to just now. You know, therefore, as a partner, we're often supporting the the sort of business case for for investment um, of time and money and resource into those kind of um, areas. And the fundamentals, I think, of the, the sort of reasoning behind investing in these kind of um, initiatives hasn't changed with the launch of Copilot. But what has changed is the conversation around it and then the sort of trigger for it and the um, conversations going on with C-suite at board level uh, around Copilot, where there is a mix, a real mix of, of perception um, of emotion, I suppose, um, and yeah, the, the sort of appetite for generative AI, ranging from really chomping at the bit, really enthusiastic um, and wanting to go for it to um, fear and avoidance. So maybe you can um, give us a, uh, a bit of participation here and vote as to the perception you have on what is the tone at the top? Uh, within your organization and do any of these uh, do any of these terms here kind of resonate with you in terms of of the feeling at a at a top level as more strategic level um, around Microsoft 365 copilot because you know what we are seeing is that the risk professionals IT professionals they they are being asked to or or feel compelled to you know put down a um, a more precise statement a more precise strategy you know for maybe for the next financial year to support Microsoft 365 copilot adoption um, you know as potentially previously unbudgeted investment you know so really having to to navigate that business case and those recommendations internally um, within the context of of that tone at the top um, which isn't always easy so I can see some here resistance uncertainty exploration um, confusion cautious optimism I think that's a that's a great term. Yeah, mm. cautious. Yeah, interesting. Thank you for that. So maybe um, these sort of uh, building blocks here might be helpful to you um, around sort of constructing a business case, constructing a, a, a recommendation um, to to invest more in assessing risk and and then sort of practically um, how to to take initiatives forward to take action on risk. And often a business case kind of falls around these, these three themes. First being taking action to minimize the negative impact of non-compliance. So often we are working with within um, heavily regulated industries and perhaps your organization is financially regulated. Um, you're definitely data privacy <laughs> regulated. Uh, you know, perhaps there are, are standards or best practices that really can't be compromised on, or you're working towards a certification like ISO 27001, um, and you need to take action to uphold those practices. And, and AI is becoming more and more, as um, Navasha discussed, sort of part of that. Secondly, there's often a theme here around taking action to really minimize the negative implications of data loss. So whether malicious, accidental, you know, the stakes can be high, you know, so, so really taking actions to avoid reputational damage, customers, suppliers, employees, um, but also the cost of investigation and litigation post breach, you know, fines from regulators can be a lot harsher um, when there is little apparent action being taken on protecting sensitive data, you know, especially when it's preventable, you know, when that detection capability is is there available, but maybe laying dormant, you know, within your organization. But the third theme here, which can actually be a really strong play and, it, and it's much uh, more of a, a positive narrative um, and something that we certainly champion is sort of positioning the adoption of data security, data con governance controls as really creating those responsible conditions for enabling technologies like Copilot, you know, so they can be taken advantage of quicker, so they can, uh, you can be promoting higher quality outcomes. And also 
you know, meaning a, a higher degree of confidence to, to consolidate into Microsoft 365. And there might be cost benefits to do that, to displace legacy platforms or, or other SaaS subscriptions and really um, strategically move more into the Microsoft ecosystem and, and kind of remove the barriers to that so that Microsoft 365 can deliver on what you're paying for, for your license fees anyway. Um, so yeah, just some food for thought there on constructing the business case. But Navasha, if if someone um, was looking internally to sort of champion this conversation, uh, walking into a meeting about it tomorrow, what advice would you give to them? Yeah, um, so firstly, good luck. Um, but also, I think it's important um, to sort of divide this threefold. So as an organization, understand the reward. So in order to do that, what is your strategy? Um, what is the reward? What are you looking to achieve? And what are those tactical use cases? So then that would then inform your whether you need a short or a long term adoption roadmap. And then who needs to help you? So do you need to bring in a partner like Cloud Essential that can help you do a maturity assessment, for example? So then we'll move on to then I think you need to move on to assessing your risk. So again, um, this is looking at your regulatory landscape, your technology that's uh, and your controls that's currently in place. Uh, what sensitive data do you already hold and how are you managing that? And then lastly, or rather looking at your permissions and your identity management. So really trying to break this down into what controls you might already have, uh, what regulations are you already subject to and what technology you might have to already further your core pilot journey. And then lastly, prioritize your quick wins. So by identifying what you might already have or by looking at deploying solutions like DLP, um, try and prioritize that and while never losing fact, I think that's this is key. Don't ever lose track of your risk and compliance universe and just your regulatory objectives as well. So your business case and your regulatory objectives and just finding that that balance. And I understand, you know, there, there isn't a one size fits all, but doing things like a readiness assessment, um, like from a cloud, cloud essentials perspective, could really help you see where you sit on that spectrum of readiness and help you inform your risk uh, a little bit better so that you can look at where, where you are in this journey. Thanks, Narasha. So just to wrap things up, you've you've heard our opinion that your readiness is is very relative to your context. There's certainly no one, two, three step generic readiness plan that you'll ever hear us preach. Um, Nivasha, you've helped us sort of frame that conversation around risk from a Microsoft commitment and then our organizational responsibility. And with that, some practical points on tackling data security, tackling data governance from people, process, policy, technology perspective, and also suggested, as you just mentioned, that these things are best initiated from that foundation of maturity um, assessing. Uh, where you can factor in your benchmarks, your regulatory landscape, your risk tolerance, your timeframes, your priorities um, to map out your next steps. And as always, you know, this conversation belongs to both risk and IT and, uh, and many stakeholders within the organization. And we've also taken a temperature uh, from you, the audience, uh, on uh, feelings towards Copilot, and yeah, leave fact, these sort of sort of readying and, and looking and assessing um, what your journey might look like with cautious optimism. Um, I do like that term. So we're going to wrap. Thank you very much for joining. I'm just going to launch a quick survey. If you'd be so kind to respond to that, it really helps us um, understand more about content that's going to be useful for you. If you are interested in um, some information about our maturity assessment or some of the purview workshops and services that we provide there, um, then you can just email Navasha directly. Um, and also there's a link there, subscribe to our newsletter for more content. So we're going to um, stop the recording now. So thank you very much for, for joining and I hope you have a lovely afternoon.